Welcome to Winchester Community Church. We're continuing our New Year's series with 1 John 4. I hope you join us. Let's talk about it. But first, let's talk to the kids. What would happen if you're throwing at me? Ready? Oh, see, he did it again. He's got a thing going on. Hi. What if I did this when he threw it? I don't like the way you threw it at me. Do you still want to play with me? <laughs> he is such a good <laughs> Do you like when people whine and complain? Do you like when people hurt you and don't apologize? No. Both of them are kind of obnoxious, aren't they? That means it's not so good. Yeah, we hate that, don't we? No, they're not so good. No. You want to try? Ready? Okay, you throw it. Ow! Wow! You hurt me! I won't let that. I'm gonna take the ball and go away. <laughs> Look at him go, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> Ow! Well, I'm broken. But other than that, do you ever have some of that happen? Somebody takes their ball and they go home. Or they take their toys. Or, you can't play with my toys anymore. Have you ever heard anybody say that? No, you have. You've got a lot of older brothers and sisters, don't you? Have you ever heard anybody say that? And you don't have to name Riley and Reed, so. Yeah. How about you? You ever have me say that? Do you know adults do silly things like that too? We all have problems, don't we? And you know, you'd think when we got bigger, we'd learn to say things like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you, or, you know, that really bothers me. Can we talk about it? And that's really important as we, because we also have to do that with God. Did you know that? Yeah, sometimes we do things that God doesn't want us to do, right? So we need to take it to we need to take it to him too, Lord. Sorry, um, but you know what makes it real easy when you know somebody loves you, right? Do you ever get in a fight maybe with an older brother, or sister, or your mom and dad, and then in the end they maybe give you a hug or something? You go, oh, I didn't like that fight, but I like it. They gave me a hug. You ever have that? These are a lot of words and they're hard to answer, so I appreciate you being very attentive. Right? How about you? You ever have that happen? So there's a conflict, or a, a, maybe a fight, or maybe, I don't know, imagine a parent. Probably you never have this happen, but you do something your parent thinks is wrong, but then they do something to let you know they love you even though they shoot you out for doing the wrong thing. Yeah. That's important, isn't it? So, and, and maybe you can help the adults work on that too, because this is a lifelong thing we have to work on. The good news is God loves that kind of thing. You know, I'll tell you what, sometimes I think I learn more from kids' sermons than others too. But you ever, you ever notice in life so often when we were little we thought it was hard, then we got older and we thought little was easy, but now where we are is hard? You ever notice how that's life? We're always learning, aren't we? We should be. All right, let's talk about the uh, idea of don't, oh, can't. How often, I hate these four letter words, especially can't or won't. And again, now for you parents, think about it when you're trying to work with your kids. I won't, right? You ever have that little temper tantrum? I won't. Or I can't. I've watched so many people like, sit there in the middle of multiple solutions and go, I can't. Well, yes, you can. There's a number of four other words I'd rather hear other than can't. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe it's hard, but can't. Now, here's the thing in life, though. There is some really important stuff in life that we can't do without love, without God's love, without God's truth. And that's why we're going to be looking at 1 John 4 and kind of walking through that today. I wanted to share with you a story, and this isn't a story made up to fit. This is the story of a real person in a real place. I did not know this person, but it was recounted to me. An old, older, older than me, godly pastor, God had been really working in him. He'd been married for a long time. His childhood was a long way off, but he... There's things he realized that God had really been kind of convicting him of that he had not confessed to his wife. And it was just getting worse and worse. He was ashamed of some of what he did as a teenager, as a 
college-age student before God really got a hold of his life. And he really felt convicted on the one hand, but he didn't really have the nerve to tell her on the other hand. And so he wrote it all down. And he prayed, and he prayed, and he prayed, and he finally said, he said, honey, would you sit down? I've been wrestling with this, and I'm going to read it to you, and I really, I hope you'll forgive me. It was before we met, but still, I just got to get this off my chest. And so he sat there, and he read it, and he read it like this. He couldn't look at her, because he also felt guilty because he never confessed to it. And he got done, and he finally got the nerve to look up, and she said, Charlie, there isn't anything you could share with me that just by sharing it would cause me to love you less. In fact, she went on to say, I don't think there's anything you can share with me that wouldn't cause me to love you more. Because the very essence of a positive relationship is that I trust you, you trust me. Now, granted, Shannon and I kick this one around a lot. It's, what if he confessed to being a serial killer? Well, you know, conceivably she could still love him more. She may not want to live in the same house. I don't know how that all works. But, <laughs> <clears throat> but generally speaking, if we're truly in love, and love is a choice, right? Don't confuse yourself. We live in this world who says, oh, it's all science, science. Until it comes to important things like love and this, oh, we just fall in and out of it, it's magic, we don't know how it happens. No, the very essence of love is choice. Anybody who's married, been more than, married for more than a couple of weeks has been able to wade through often a lot of junk because they chose to, right? Sometimes things don't work, problems can arise. But you know, there's a reason why we should celebrate anniversaries of two years, 20 years, 46 years and beyond, because they're remarkable. It's a place that God works, knocking off the rough edges, showing us grace through another individual, and then hopefully, as that marriage matures, we're modeling grace for others. And of course, we can show grace in other places, but God often uses marriage as an example of Him with the church, him with us. And Charlie just happened to be a good immediate human example that we could kind of understand it. It's love in action. Charlie's not so remarkable to me. I mean, yeah, there's some real bravery perhaps um, and, and, and responding to God's you know, conviction for some issues he needed to bring into light. But I think his wife was all the more impressive. I mean, you know how it is. Think of all the stuff that we get churned up on our lives because of the baggage we come with, right? Every one of us has been hurt someplace. Every one of us has been told lies or had lies told about us, sometimes by the people we think love us. That hurts. And so when we move into other relationships or even the same relationship years later, getting past that baggage can be tough when somebody comes out with a confession. Even like this, where it was long before they ever met. But that's love in action. And there's that challenge we have because Jesus is the epitome of love in action. Right? He didn't have to come to earth, but he chose to, following God the Father's plan. He did have to die because he was the only person, because he was holy man, holy God, who could come and be sinless. Because I, Adam, screwed it up. That's why the Bible talks about him as being a second Adam. But because of all that, because of all the ugliness that he went through, we have opportunity. That's where we can read in 1 John 4.18, true love casts out all fear. We see that God is in control. He loves us even with the life of his only begotten son, Jesus, the son of God. And God makes a way for us. We also read in John 14.6, what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know that verse. If you don't, say, put it to memory. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way to God the Father because of the love and sacrifice I have made. That is the truth that God loves you and wants to be connected with you. And life comes through that. And that's what I want you to talk, talk about 
with us today. Because look at this. I love this t-shirt. I may not be perfect, but Jesus thinks I'm to die for. <laughs> That's an important truth. And it may be a little cavalier in the way it's presented, but, but it's an essential truth in Scripture. If we don't get that, we're not going to get it. If you would, please, turn with me to 1 John, back towards the book of Revelation, towards the very back of the Bible on the right-hand side. 1 John, chapter 4. This is a, John is known as the Apostle of Love. This is a great little book that synopsizes so many important things that John talks about through his ministry. And notice what it starts with. We're going to read this whole chapter and then go back and deal with parts of it. Interestingly enough, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For there are many problems prophets have gone out into the world. This may seem like a separate issue, but it's not. I don't know Charlie's heart, but I know I've been in places like that, that I need to confess. I confess to God and I confess to the injured party or to the person who should know but doesn't, something that maybe I hadn't confessed or that I had lied about or had done wrongly. Um, but getting to the truth is really important. Because if you don't get the truth into a situation, if you don't get light into a situation, it's like a nasty wound that kind of scabs over, but there's still that pussy mess underneath and it just gets worse and worse. This is not separate from love. Truth and love go hand in hand, just as we've seen in what Jesus says so frequently. But our, it, our enemies, the world of flesh and devil, seek to separate us from the truth of God's love for us and the ability that we have to learn to love through him when we're in Christ. But how do we do this? And that's what this chapter then goes on to say. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. The spirit of Antichrist, anything that is opposed to Christ, that can be something that sounds nice, like the Jesus plus message that you get in so many different places. Well, Jesus and this. Jesus and this practice. Jesus and this potion or this incantation or whatever. Jesus and Buddha, it doesn't really matter. It's not Jesus plus. That's the Antichrist. That's a lie. So we can see it just knowing that. We can see it when it's counter to Scripture. We can see it as we're praying or as just as we're going along the day. And sometimes you have those spots pop in your head. Just think back. Who is Jesus? You might be surprised what the response is. You know, we see it in the world practically. We see it written. We see it, or we can hear it even in our heads. Who is Jesus? If the answer is he's a good teacher, he's a good man, he's a great leader, a great example, those are all true, but they're also essentially a lie. Because they haven't gotten to the core of the issue. They're ignoring the fundamental thing. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord and Savior. That's what John is talking about, and that's why it's so important to know that in relationship with love. If Jesus, if God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, are the epitome of of love, of that relationship stays together, the triune God, and then shows us that love and encourages us to join a relationship with his children, that exposing the truth, that getting to the issue is very important. It's essential. And then we go on, God is love. Let me tell you, just in case you forgot, John says, beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. This is how you know the difference between those who have the title Christian and are Christians, those who live it out. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Often those who don't love are just like we were talking about with the little kids and balls. I'm going to take the ball and go away because you won't do what I want. I don't like you anymore. Blah, blah, blah. Right? We see ugly adult versions of this, but it's true throughout life. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. And we're talking about Jesus. That God sent his only son in the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be, big fancy word, propitiation for our sins. That those sins are taken care of. They're covered. Because we couldn't. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. One has 
No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. I Meaning we haven't seen God the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen God, if you've seen me, you've seen God the Father. By this we know that we abide in him, and he is in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. He said three things. You need the truth, you need love, and you need to be clear the truth about love is God manifested in Jesus. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love of God has for us. That's a constant process. The world is not about love. The world is about lust. It's about desire. It's about getting what you want in the moment. But true love, abiding love, agape love, is not how the world rolls. By this love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence. How often are we driven by fear? How often, and where does that fear come from? We're afraid of what we can't do. We're afraid of the consequences, the punishments. Here he talks about that for the day of judgment, because as he is also, we are in the world. Now in verse 18, there is no fear in love. He's talking about true love, not conditional love that the world of really relies on, I'll love you if. God's love transcends that. But perfect love casts out all fear. I mean, can you imagine you have somebody who comes up to you and says, I'm celebrating my, whatever, 20th wedding anniversary with my spouse. Oh, cool. How's that going? Oh, it's great. I haven't seen him for 19 years, but it's, <laughs> it's going really, really well. <laughs> Uh, there's something going on there. I'm not sure that's love, and I'm not sure that's healthy, but, right? Love is perfected in relationship, and specifically in God's kingdom, it's perfected in Christ. What Christ did, and our relationship, coming to accept that, acknowledge that, and follow in Christ. We love because he first loved us. We kind of understand it. Not always. One of the biggest things we have in relationships as far as conflicts is we show love and the person we show love to doesn't get it, right? You've had that happen. I won't name the child of mine, but I saw something on sale one day and I had to get it because she had desired this for years and I wanted to bless her. And I got that and I paid for it and I was rejoicing all the way home. And as soon as I got there, I said, hey, I got you something. Come here. And she came into my office and I pulled out the Walmart bag. And I go, here, this is for you. And she kind of looked at it like I just handed her roadkill. And she reaches out with a couple fingers and she gingerly takes the bag and she looks inside and she pulls it out and she looks at it and she instantly bursts into tears. Tears of joy? No, tears of anger. How dare you present a gift this way without a card and the proper wrapping in the right setting. And if you know love languages, this is an extreme gift giver, right? And she does. I mean, she plans gifts for months in advance. Whereas most people go, oh, okay, fine, it's in a pan brown paper bag. I'm cool with that, right? It took us a long time to work through that. And so we don't always get our love reciprocated. But God suffers that too as he tries to break through so we can hear him. But we have some measures. If we know God, if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, submitted to him, we see our lives changed by the Holy Spirit, and love becomes emphasized. And that's where we read in verse 20, in the end of 19, we love because he first loved us. We saw that example, we got it, and then God got to work. But we know in 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You see Jesus talk about this multiple times in the Gospels. You see Paul talking about it elsewhere. John talks about it. Um, look at Galatians 5. The difference between uh, the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit, love. You know, what's on the list of, of fruits of the flesh? Gossip, slander, anger, murder. Oh, if I don't get my own way. 
what's on the other list in Galatians 5? Long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, love for God, love for others. Let's talk about something there. The good news about God's love is it overcomes the past. Many are trapped in the past. I've told, told you, have been here before, I have been amazed. One of the things that I think is very positive about American culture, and I believe it, and it's true in much of the Western uh, world, and it comes from Christianity, is looking to the future. There is hope in the future. We can't change the past, but we can change the day, and we can change the future. And so God opens up that door. Now, I don't, what happened with Pastor Charlie after he shared that confession? It actually deepened their relationship. You trusted me enough to share that with me. And Charlie said, you trusted me enough to listen to me, and you still loved me anyway. It deepened the relationship. As we turn things over to God rather than run away and hide in the corner, it deepens the relationship. But you know, a lot of people want to run away. They want to be in control. They want to hide. And they think that's somehow safe. And the enemy's right there in your ears going, yeah, it's only you, baby. It's only you. It's all about you. You be God now. You control things. But go back to verse 18. There is no fear in love. Control issues are often if not always, about us being afraid of what might happen to us or something we care about. But if we continue in 18, but perfect love casts out fear. If we say God is at work and we believe God is at work, there is peace. Yeah, we may have temporary challenges as we begin to process something, but we don't constantly live in fear. It's not about what everybody else thinks. It's not about whatever can happen to us. Life is ugly. There are bad things that happen in this world. You are correct. But if that's all you want to focus on, then you look like a lot of other countries I've been in. I still remember a place in Afghanistan where we were going to work on their village first, and then, well, we, the military, it was an army unit. And then down the road was another village. They would be next. Each week, the equipment we were using to help this village got sabotaged. And we kept stepping up security because we figured it must be the Taliban or somebody else. Finally, we caught the people who did it. It wasn't the Taliban, per se. It wasn't Al-Qaeda. In this village, the people in this village who hadn't yet had their village worked on were sneaking over at night and sabotaging the equipment so that this village couldn't get work done. Because, by golly, they're not going to have something before we have it. You know? You know the old saying, what's the problem with an eye for an eye as a rule of thumb? Pretty soon all you do is live in a, in a country full of blind people. That's focusing on the past. And if you've never, you've never done it, I hope you don't have to, but this idea of, well, my grandfather's 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 grandfather was upset by your grandfather's 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 grandfather, so I'm going to hate you, right? Or you're the wrong color for me, or you're the wrong nationality for me, or you're the whatever. Get over yourselves. That's part of God's message to us. That's not what it's about. You know, as we read here, that Greek for punishment, koliosis, um, it's talking about we're afraid of what will happen eternally, but you know, there's a lot of fear in what will happen immediately, too. What will happen if I'm not in control? This is a place for all of us. It may not be in all of our lives, maybe just parts of our lives. But these are the places that we really have to give back to God. Not only do we look for the eternal issues and want to be his sheep versus the goats that we talk about being punished in Matthew 25, 46, those who reject Jesus, but we want to be giving things up now, submitting to him. Part of that is death to self. I'm turning this over to you, Lord. I really want to control it. But if we're honest, really, why would we trust us more than the creator of the universe. Usually it's because we're not sure he loves us. I refer you back to Jesus. Something else to look out for, and I already mentioned it, is that tendency for us to isolate. Um, 2 Corinthians 11.3 talks about how the enemy likes to isolate us. And we know the enemy and all of his minions, John 8.44, what is he? The father of lies? He inspires hatred, murder, division. If that's what you're seeing, lies, murder, division, hatred, you know you're not dealing with anything that's truly from the kingdom of God. 
But if he can, he walks about like a roaring lion seeking to destroy us. And the way to destroy people is by lies and isolation. Here's some of the key lies that Satan uses. Be like God starts all the way back in Genesis. You can be like God. No, God is like God. We're not. We're the servants of God. We're the children of God. You're alone. God uses this one a lot, guys. And I would be amazed if there, if there's anybody in this room who's never felt alone. Clearly, you live a different existence than I'm aware of. It doesn't matter whether it's in a competition for something at school or for a, a relationship or for a job or what have you, or those things that we think, I can never let this out because nobody will ever love me. God knows already. You can't hide from him. Come on, guys. But we get those games going on, and the devil loves it because we're isolated. Here's another one. Real God. If it was a real God, he wouldn't allow you to suffer, or he'd answer every one of your prayers. thought about putting a clip up from Bruce Almighty, for those of you who remember that. God gave him responsibility for about three blocks of, of a city to answer prayer. He was overwhelmed, so he said yes to everything. It caused chaos, right? Remember Ian? Ian's a big fella. But when he was five, would you give Ian a chainsaw? Would you give some of us a chainsaw now? No, you shouldn't, right? We need to, God is looking out for us and what he gives us. Not every answer is yes, here you go. But the enemy wants to tell you, well, that was important to you, so you should have gotten it. He doesn't love you if you don't get everything you want. And then here's another one. The church often is really bad about promoting this life, Satan. Well, just try harder. If you just do harder, it'll be better. If only you had more faith. If only you did better, if only you clean yourself up, then you could come to church and be accepted. What is that? That's conditional love. That's not the gospel. That's not Jesus loves you. That's Jesus loves you if. That's another Jesus plus lie. The enemy uses that a lot. We don't want to encourage that. Does that mean we don't have responsibility? Yes, we do. But our response to God isn't about trying to get him to love us because we're better today. He loves us already. We want to live up to that love. You ever heard the old saying, some of you have a lot of dogs, maybe one dog, I wish I was the person my dog thinks I am. Right? I wish I was more like Jesus. They're not that much different. What I want to be is more like him. And then drag it into the light. A lot of things, you've heard them, but I just wanted to remind you of them. We are, those who have accepted Jesus as Savior, are children of light. We read that in 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Those in Christ are children of light. They've been brought out of darkness. Don't keep running and hiding in the shadows. Jesus said, we're the light of the world. We're the light of the world. He's the light of the world. We're in him. That means we're the light of the world. And that's where we should live. Matthew 5.14. Everything becomes visible in the light of God's truth and love. Ephesians 5.13. Drag it into the light. John 3.21, Jesus says, He who practices truth comes into the light. Pastor Charlie was practicing truth. Probably should have done it a long time ago. But with God's prompting, he did it, and it was a benefit. I'm not saying that necessarily is the practice we should always do in terms of, you know, just because willy-nilly we saw one example, but if God convicts us, we need to follow through. He who practices truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having from God, John 3, 21. And then don't forget what God says about those who are in him. You, John writes, or excuse me, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9, are a chosen race by God, a royal priesthood appointed by God, a holy nation set aside from God, a people for God's own possession and given to Jesus as his own. We are called from darkness to light. We are called from the darkness of this world and our enemies to the light of God made manifest in the light and love of Jesus Christ. And with that, we can look to the future and open up doors. God's love enables us in the challenges of the future, too. Actually, I got a little ahead of myself. God's love enables us today. There is a battle every day. There will be a battle every day. And the more you're doing what God wants, the more likely you're going to find a battle in your day. God, 
if, ne if you're never bothered by anything, if everything is just kind of, well, hey, it's all good. There's a good chance that you're not doing anything that threatens Satan's kingdom, right? If nobody thinks you're not a fanatic, if there's not a single person that thinks you're a fanatic, you're probably not on the right track. Because the world is easily offended by Jesus. But think about Pastor Charlie again. He's now suited these old things. Anything that might have been hindered are now taken care of. He and his wife can grow even further. Grace is shown. Forgiveness is shown. They're moving forward together. And we see this with God, too. Matthew 8, 26. Jesus says, Why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Remember, he's talking to the, in that setting, he's talking to the apostles, the disciples, who are in the boat, and there's a storm at sea. He's asleep in the back. Master, wake up! You don't care about us! Ever thought something like that in your life? Feel something like that in your life? God knows. And he gets up and he says, all right, knock it off. And the storm stops. And then he rebukes them. He said, don't you, haven't you figured out who I am yet? That I love you, that you're okay, you're with me. Safest place to be in the world. Thought of this on more than a few battlefields is where God wants you to be. I mean, you know, we can just as readily die by falling in our bathtub as by going someplace where there's cameras or bad guys, right? God is the place to go. Psalm 34, 4. David says this, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Or in 56, 3, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. You know, we can't God, judge God's love on the basis of circumstances. One of the things we know about feelings, what do feelings do? They always tell the truth. Nah, come on. They lie, don't they? Well, I feel like Sometimes those feelings are true, but a lot of times feelings lie to us, and the enemy gets in there and digs in a wedge. But you know, like in John 16, 33, we're reminded there will be trials, but God is still there. Paul tells the Ephesians in chapter 3, you know, don't let tribulations, don't let trials discourage you. And if you're honest, for those of you who have been know and have been growing in Jesus how often in those trials do you actually feel more alive? You see God at work in your lives in ways that he never has been because you have to let go of control and say, God, it's you. I can't do this. And then he answers prayer. And you go, wow, God, you're at work. Not because we deserve it, not because we're some amazing, incredible creatures, but because he chose to love us. Remember where we started? Love is a choice. God chose to love us. And then we look at the future. Again, where are they going in the future? Probably someplace better if we're looking at Charlie and his wife. We talked about 1 Corinthians 13, love. The love chapter is great. What do we know about love? From 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4, love is patient, it's kind, it does not envy or boast, it's not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable, irritable and resentful doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This world will end, we will end, evil will end, Satan's kingdom will end, but love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away, tongues they will cease, as for knowledge will pass away. But love never ends. That's an incredible promise. That's an incredible truth. Think about relationships, whether we're the kids fighting over a ball, or whether partners fighting over business or marital relations, what have you. Can you imagine if your argument went something like this? I'm not really sure you're getting enough. No, I don't think you're getting enough. I think we need to look out. No, no, I really need to look out for you more. That's not how most arguments go, is it? I don't get what I deserve. Frankly, if we get what we deserve, we're in trouble, right? God loves us and gives us what we don't deserve. That's grace. We would be well off just with mercy. I'm not giving you what you do deserve, right? But in Jesus, he gives us what we don't deserve. I want you to be my child. I want you to have power. I want you to have position in my kingdom. I want you to be with me. That's pretty cool. 
Very hard for us to get. I, I struggle to wrap my head around that. But then God gives me glimpses. And of course you can read about in 2 Timothy 4 where he's laid up crowns of righteousness for all who have loved him and looked to his appearing. In James 1.12 he says, those who remain steadfast in him are going to receive a crown of life because God has promised it to those who love him. But is that what we're really striving for? Are we going, wow, if only I have that crown? I don't think so. I think what we're really looking for is, wow, if only I had somebody I could trust in now. Right? And the best relationships, whether they're marital, whether they're a parent to child, whether they're friend to friend, I know I can trust them. If they tell me they're going to do it, they're going to do it. And then all the more, I know they care about me. Think about how lucky you are if you have one friend, if you have one spouse, if you have one child, one parent. She go, I know when everything else goes down the chute, they love me and they care about me. That's what God is offering us. And that's how, because humans are frail, we can actually rely upon him through the challenges of life. I was reminded this week of John Bunyan. You may not know him, but let's do a little pop quiz. The Bible is the number one most printed book in the history of mankind. Okay. In the English language, the second most, well actually, the second most printed book in the history of mankind, or maybe the third, probably the second, is written by a guy named John Bunyan. What's the book? Some of you have read it. Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress. And where did he write it? In jail. John Bunyan was a tinker. He had some skills in mending metal, but he had this challenge. He went from being a soldier and a ne'er-do-well who was known both for his ability to drink and to swear, got married, and was exposed to Jesus. He had a godly wife. And it, didn't like, it wasn't like instantaneous. He had to watch this process. And over the years, he came to know the Lord. And when the Lord entered his life, everything changed. But you see, he had a problem. He didn't agree with the country, the Church of England's view and the country's view, which is the same. So he had to go to jail. Now, frankly, there were hundreds of people during this time he went to jail who were executed because they had crazy ideas like, um, we only can come to know the Lord through the covering blood of Jesus Christ. Shocking stuff, right? Christians are dying from that today. John Bunyan was in a period where in England they were dying because of that. And God gave him 12 years in a prison. He left his second wife. His first wife died in childbirth. He had it to a with a child who, um, with a child who was blind, if I remember correctly. And his new wife, he got married just before he went to prison for 12 years who then had four stepchildren to raise. She lost her baby. Stress in the family, you think? <laughs> she couldn't work because she was taking care of children, and it wasn't like there was a lot of opportunities for women in the 1700s. But God provided. And in those trials, John Bunyan grew to produce something that the world still knows today. I think it's been printed in over 400 languages because there's a truth in it that was borne out by trials. Not everything comes by trials, but often trials will make us. And so don't be afraid of trials. Don't be afraid of the future. God is there. He stands time. And as we think about this in closing, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Remember that from the future. Faith. Faith in him. We can't hide from God. We can try. We can let the enemy isolate us. Which can keep us from help and health and healing and relationship with God and others. You know, at heart, when it's just the flesh, we're not interested in serving God. We're not interested in serving others. We want what we want when we want it. There's a part of us that's never much different than a two-year-old. But you know, God calls us to walk in the light, to know his son, that's how we can truly live. Is there a risk in doing this? Yes. Is there a risk in loving others? Yes. Is there a risk in trusting God? Yes. The world says these are all foolish things. You've got to get what you can get. Forget everybody else. God says just the opposite. If you want to be first in my kingdom, 
be last. Don't sit at the front, sit at the back. Look out for the interests of others, serve others. But the enemy gets a hold of us in that little sinful nature, and gets us isolated. He loves it. Go ahead, hate those people because they don't give you what you want. You deserve it. You can say, I'm never going to forgive you. That's what the enemy says. God says, no, my kids love me, and I love them. I love them when they didn't love me, and I'm, and I'm going to continue loving them. He opens the door through Jesus Christ, and he wants us to be secure in his love, to know there is one who cares. He wants us to grow as his children so that is reflected in our lives to others. And so it's just a day-to-day -day practice. Just like we talked about last week, every day is a new beginning. Every day, hey, we have the opportunity to move towards the future. We can rest in the past, or we can move towards the future. Will we deal with baggage from the past as we move into the future? You bet. It's the nature of life. But we look to God, and we first make sure that we have that relationship with Jesus. I submit to you. I can't do it on my own. Forgive me. And we look to God for insight. And we kind of put stuff in, right? We're listening to stuff every day, right? How often are we on these things? Or on our tablets, or our televisions, or our radios, or whatever. And it's just pumping in. If we go once or twice a week and go, oh, that's kind of a nice verse. If we hope that everything in an hour session in church is going to cover it all, we're wrong. We've got to be putting the truth in, right? Like we talked about a couple weeks ago, ego, garbage in, garbage out. If you want the truth of God, put the truth of God in. Not the lies of the world. Ask God to help you. I know some of you go, it's hard to read. Understand. Read one verse. Soak in it. Soak in it for a week if you want. Maybe by the end of the week you'll know that verse by heart and it'll be meaningful to you. It's not about how many pages you read. It's how much truth you absorb. So ask God. Seek after God in that. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you that we can come to you. We thank you that you do love us. We thank you that you're there. And as challenging as it is, with all the garbage around us, Father, move. Father, I pray. Work, I ask, Lord. And I thank you that you will work, that you are working. May we know your love better in whatever the situations we're struggling in. Whether it's obvious to others or not, Father, may you work in our hearts that we might know your life, that we might know your son, and that life of his may pour out from us, and that we are resting in that love, in that relationship. Not in what we're doing, not in how we're doing it, not in crowns may we receive or risks that we may take, but that we rely upon you because you're at work in us. I pray your blessing and protection work in the minds of each one of us, I pray, Father. I thank you in Jesus' name. We're glad you can join us. You can contact us through many means to include our new website, winchester-church.com. But in the meantime, we're praying for you.